to our coach development webinar. Today we are joined by my good friend Johnny O'Sullivan. Uh, John, thanks for joining us and uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your journey. Hey, hey, Chris, thanks for having me on and thank you all for <clears throat> attending and, and listening in. I was going to say at this early hour, but I guess it's early for me on the west coast and maybe not so early for those of you on the east coast um so yeah thanks for being on i probably know a lot of you um spent five years as a rush technical director and um then left that to start change the game project uh, back in 2012 2013 and um you know that that journey from from full-time coach to full-time coach facilitator mentor educator has been um, an awesome journey um you know again traveling all over the world chris and i were just talking before we got started i'm off to italy here in two days and just got back from china and australia so some of the things we'll talk about today are not american problems or rush problems they're world sport problems and world sport solutions so yeah that's kind of the the change of the game project journey of you know been i think six rush fests in a row now or something like that to do parent education and, and coach education i actually this year will um, get that they've, they've given me a break so i won't be back there this year but maybe the year after we'll see um and and yeah so always always uh always fun brilliant brilliant and so you spent five years in oregon um but your journey goes a little deeper right started in long island if i'm not mistaken son of a yeah. fireman john yeah, son of a New York City fireman um, who got hurt pretty badly and decided to, um, well, didn't decide, was forced to retire from the fire department and uh, uh, became, a, became a lawyer. Um, but uh, my, uh, yeah, my journey was, you know, the multi-sport kid growing up on Long Island and then, um, uh, you know, doing lots of sports, but really in high school, um, found you know that my love my passion was definitely playing soccer and um, decided that you know I wanted to try to continue and play with that and I went to this really good high school I, I grew up in this little town and then I went to this uh, Catholic high school called St. Anthony's and uh, realized like oh my gosh like there's a lot of good players and and um, it's really good and you know one of my high school classmates was Chris Armas who's now the head coach of the Red Bulls and um, a bunch of others, I think like 11 kids in my grade went and played Division One college soccer. So that was sort of the level that it, it jumped to. And uh, so decided I would chase that, played uh, college soccer at Fordham University in New York City, um, played in the USL for the Wilmington Hammerheads for a little while after, um, but uh, got hurt again and really fell in love with coaching. And so... I took a high school coaching job, then went to the University of Vermont for four years as an assistant coach up there on both the men's and women's side, and then um, met my wife and so went to Michigan, and then ultimately now 13 years in uh, Oregon. Um, just, you know, I was, as, as my good friend Jerry Yeagley says to me, John, you are one of the smartest coaches uh, I know because you were smart enough to marry a doctor. And so you keep coaching. And so that's been my my journey there for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we have, a, we have a few mutual friends there. One being uh, Jerry Yeagley, the godfather of college soccer. Um, I think we worked at Indiana camps, but never together, if I'm not. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, and then uh, uh, when you were at University of M Vermont, one of my mentors was uh, Dr. Roy Patton. I believe you served as an assistant under Roy, and and that's one of the connections on on how we met. Um, but then I remember actually meeting with you in PDT at Rush Select, and you were the under 16 girls, maybe coach. And uh, didn't you lose half the group because they had food poisoning at Subway? Something. Yeah, and and, yeah. and myself and Jeremy Bernard, the other coach as well. We all we all got floored. Um, it, that was the craziest tournament I've ever been a part of. Um, but uh, somehow we 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 it rained and we had a shootout. Um, you know, they just they took a, a whole like the quarterfinal game. All they did was a shootout. And our goalkeeper Rachel, who I also coached in Oregon, was uh, she's just the best and. Um, she was so sick and I so I drove the van of all the pukers to the game and we um, 
you know, we were like pulling over on the highway and then we go to the shootout and, and Rachel carries uh, the full garbage can over to the goal and she puts it next to the post and she proceeds to save three penalties. But between every penalty kick, she's just retching into the garbage can. I mean, the whole other team mentally was destroyed after that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we ended up making it to the final where we finally ran out of gas. But I was like subbing players in and out of the game so they could run into the woods and vomit. It was it was quite the adventure for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was uh, quite the adventure. And of course, you know, our paths uh, kept to, kept crossing. Um, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, you came to Wisconsin when I was at Wisconsin Rush and you did some talks. And uh, and then I've been a fan and a follower. Obviously, I, I think we were talking and your your podcast way of champions which is brilliant comes out every sunday uh, i think you're 145 episodes in and they get me through my workout so thank you for doing that thousand downloads a day and we've been fans and sharing your work and uh i know you wrote the first book right changing the game and then you know five six years ago did you did you ever imagine john it would be what it is taking you all over the world now and doing what you're doing uh, no, I, I certainly didn't think it would be um, this big. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I kind of felt like, you know, when I started changing the game project, you know, I'd go to Rush Select, I'd go to, you know, I remember the Rush Summit when, you know, we sat around one table, right? There'd be like 12 of us at a table. And, um, you know, we, you, you talk about these things that are going on and, and, you know, what, what I kept realizing was if everyone has the same issues or same problems, there's got to be more to it than um, there's got to be more to it. You know, they're like, this is a pain point for people and I'm looking for solutions. It was really a, that time around parent education and um, and I wasn't finding them. So I said, well, maybe I can sort of share what I've learned over a lot of years of running clubs and coaching kids of all ages and yeah, but I never thought, you know, m most of my work now is not in the soccer world. It's outside. I mean, I'm going to Italy to work for the International Ski Federation. I was in Australia working for Rugby League. And so I think that's what's re really cool about it is yeah. that many, many sports are looking outside of their own sport for solutions. And I think before this, they were very insular soccer only looked at soccer baseball only looked at baseball and now they're all picking their head up and saying what can we learn from ice hockey what can we learn from all these other sports and that's what i think will make world sport and, and coaching especially better yeah and i agree now uh this isn't scripted so i'm gonna ask but you know having done all your travels and and seen what you've seen working with other sports if you could isolate three common problems what, what would you say, you know, are there three, is it five? What, what are always the crossover issues in your, in your views and in, in what- From, you, a, from a, just a sport in general or from a coaching yeah. standpoint? I would say sport in general, and then from a coaching standpoint. So two pronged. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, sport, sport in general, uh, you know, certainly the, the business of sport versus the science of sport. Right. And and what the science of sport says is early diversity, early sport sampling um, gives kids ownership, helps them find the things that they're good at, all that sort of stuff versus the business of sport, which says sign them up early, make them commit year round, make them specialize. And, and really, if you go through every paper on sport specialization from psychological and burnout issues and social issues and physical issues. Um, there's not a single paper that says it's a good thing, yeah. right? There's, it's all that th this is detrimental. And I think one of the most interesting papers comes out because certainly soccer is a sport where early engagement is super important, right? Kids have to play when they're young. There's no story of someone finding a soccer ball for the first time when they're 17 and becoming a pro. Um, so, so because of the nature of the game, early engagement's important, but turning soccer players into athletes, giving them a multi-movement experience creates this robust athlete that then can withstand a training load later on. And so 
I've been to Manchester United. I've, you know, I've been to La Masia. I've, I've, I've been to these places where, you know, they're gymnastics gyms. They do parkour. They do martial arts. Even though those kids are playing tons of soccer, they're all athletes, right? So I think this is the biggest one is that we try to make people soccer players before they become athletes. Or we give up the athlete development side and we lay on a lot of uh, sports specific skills um, before kids learn to move correctly. And you go out on so many fields and watch how many kids are moving incorrectly, moving inefficiently and moving maybe in an unsafe manner. And that's why you have, you know, I, I just saw this stat yesterday, a 400% increase in ACL surgeries on pre-teenagers. 400%. 400%. Crazy. Yeah, that, that's, that's crazy. So that'd be number one. And, and two, because of that, then there's this focus on outcomes really, really young, focus on tryouts, focus on selecting kids as young as possible to be on the A team. And I don't think that there's a problem with, with tiering teams and putting kids, letting children experience sports with kids of like ability. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have both, but when all of a sudden, you know, I, I have a friend, David Epstein, who wrote a great book called Range and the Sports Gene. And he was telling me the story how he lived in Brooklyn, New York. And he said there was a U7 travel team, right, right yeah. down the street from my house. And they're a travel team and they're practicing four days a week. And he said, I just can't imagine that a group of seven-year-olds can't find a game in a city of 10 million people that they have yeah. to travel. And that's the that's it right there. Right, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and I think about growing up on Long Island um, in in the '80s, where all the good players were split across many teams. So you just got all these good games, and there was three or four here and three or four there. There wasn't too many, you know. There wasn't these super teams of all the players who all of a sudden couldn't get a game on Long Island anymore because there were so many good players. You know, I think my high school conference had ended up with seven players in Major League Soccer. So you know, when you think of things like that, you're just like, man, is this really the, 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 the pathway? Um, why can't we just wait a little bit longer, develop as many kids as possible, let them grow and then figure out, you know, who's going to make it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you're spot on. And obviously like, you know, one of my philosophies has always been, can we keep as many kids playing for as long as possible in the best possible environment? Right. But we're in this, you know, and I've heard you say it, and I've heard Stu Armstrong say it, we're in the races to the wrong finish lines and the race to the bottom and how quickly can we get these kids. And uh, I don't see collaboration between sports. Sometimes I don't see collaboration between, you know, teams and coaches within the same club, you know, because, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, but. and it's tough, man, I mean, because, again, if I'm soccer and I, you know, there's a... There's a sports scientist from South Africa named Ross Tucker, and he's one of the podcasts I listen to, Real Science of Sport. And he, he put it for me really, really well. He, he has a, a great two-part podcast on, on, on this uh, very issue. And he said, here's the problem. If <clears throat> there's 10 people who own a coffee shop and research comes out that says drinking coffee before 11 a.m. will shorten your life by 20 years. And nine of us say, oh my God, look at the research. We're not opening till 11. And one person says, ooh, look at all that business. I'm opening at yeah. six. We're all going out of business. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the same thing with sport. All the research says, don't force them to specialize before then. But if, if soccer, hockey, and lacrosse all say, okay, we're going down that path and baseball doesn't, Baseball will scoop up all the kids. And so you know, this is the problem. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does uh, one sport have to give up? Does one sport have to step aside? The, this, these are the issues, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think if you become more multi-sport, you know, and I, I know you've had Steve Boyle on two for one sports, getting the sports together, getting coaches together to discuss some of the issues, uh, you know, I think that the children win in the long run, right? And when we look at the epide epidemic of um, obesity throughout the US, you know, what does that do? You know, mm -hmm. so, but yeah. What, what would you say the third issue is, John? 
You know, the, those two, I think, are combined with just the world that we live in now as parents. You know, you have kids, I have kids, mine are 12 and 14. Um, it, there's just so much fear out there. Uncertainty as a parent, pressure to keep up with the Joneses that I think it didn't exist 20 years ago because there wasn't social media for everyone to post, look how awesome we're doing this weekend. And and so this this constant um, bombardment of look how great everyone else's kid is doing, what's wrong with my kid, forces us to keep up and say, oh, well, we better sign up for the extra training. We better get the extra tutor. We would do this. And all of a sudden, because of that fear of missing out, parents just kind of grab ownership of the sport experience and say, and say, you know, okay, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and they never really ask the kids. And because there's this extrinsic reward at the end, sometimes getting a scholarship or also realistically using sport to get into a university that maybe you couldn't get into on your own, kids lose ownership over that whole experience. Mm -hmm. And once you lose ownership, you lose enjoyment and then you lose intrinsic motivation and and i think it's just important to recognize which kids want it and which kids don't you know my my daughter plays club soccer and doesn't really ever pick up a ball outside of practice right my son goes out in the yard in the snow and juggles yeah but i mean this is this you know there's just a difference and i can't force her to be him But what I can do is sort of frame it as you recognize that someone out there is working harder than you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So that when the day comes where you don't make the team or you don't that, you know, we'll just point to all the days when you chose to do something else. And and it's your choice. And I love you to death. And most importantly to me, I want you to be a great human being. Yeah. But absolutely. don't tell me you want to play college soccer because that's not what you're doing. That's not what you're doing, yeah, absolutely. Um, Juan Gonzalez Mendia just just joined us and uh, joined us, and he says, uh, England, "England rugby will push children to go and practice another sport at least one weekend a month, which you know is huge." And he said, uh, "Keeping up with the Joneses syndrome, which is what you just talked about, John, as well." So, Juan, thanks for joining us, and uh, hey, I hope. Yeah. I hope that spicy curry, I hope you have lots of milk for the curry you've just had in the Middle East. So You know, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I think could be really interesting because we also deal with, well, one of the biggest problems in sport is facilities issues, right? So it, it's really hard for people to do both because, you know, everyone's got to lock down their facilities or, you know, you're a hockey club and you had to build your own ice rink. Well, that's expensive. My club here in Central Oregon, we're a Timbers affiliate, and we just built two turf fields. It's two and a half million dollars because the park district doesn't build fields for us. So what what are you supposed to do, right? We just had to build a facility so kids could play sport because our local government won't. And then what happens is, well, you have to pay for it somehow, which means offering extra programming and doing this. I have a friend in Canada named Mark Maloney, who's a big guy in the uh, ice hockey world. And one of the things he's trying to do there is set up this, uh, he has this program, I think it's called Global Sports Academies, where he goes into the public schools and he looks for like the high level, he's got uh, ice hockey players now and golfers. And he says, well, when you look at ice rinks, what's, you know, from, 5 a.m. till 8 a.m. and from 4 p.m. till midnight, everyone wants that time. But during the day, they sit empty. He said, well, if we've got all these high-level hockey players out of school, why not introduce a curriculum for them where from 8 to 10 a.m. they go to hockey practice and then go to school and then instead of starting sports at 3, they finish the school day from 3 to 5. So he's introduced this curriculum that lets them use the facilities when no one's using them and then have a later school day and finish their school day doing a a leadership and a character development curriculum. And see, I think that's where we have to be clever. Absolutely. And and one of your guests and my guest, Paul Ziantowski, uh, he showed us the science behind, you know, the brain 
after exercise, right? So if we're getting these kids doing exercise first, it's more likely they will succeed with their, with their studies after, right? right. And we get them sleep, so it's not like we make them go exercise at 6 a.m. Yeah. So this is where I think we need creative school districts and sporting yeah. programs that say, you know, we'll give you the opportunity to train during the day and then you stay at school later. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just think yeah, that's... No, I, listen, I think, I think it's huge, right? And you talk about facilities there and how, you know, yours, you just have to spend 2.5 million as a club and essentially that gets passed on to the parents, those costs, and then the club has to do the programming, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then I, I'm just coming back from Missouri where they have 45 like turf fields within a 15 minute radius, right? Mm -hmm. Which are city owned, uh, you know, but that's a whole other political aspect that, you know, we could probably have three webinars on and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's huge, the school stuff there, John. Um, just, you know, we go, I, I started a program uh, just to get back into the community and there's 55 elementary schools in Virginia Beach. And we've visited 42 of the 55. So in this span of two and a half, three years, the, the staff and I, we've coached, uh, po you know, through positive di discipline. We go in, take over the PE class all day, introduction to soccer, and we teach every grade. Um, so we've, we've probably taught, coached and taught 80,000 kids through that process, you know, and just promoting the sport of soccer, not, not to say, hey, come play for Rush, but it's, this is our sport. It can be done in a positive manner. And the growth that we had in that time has been, you know, has been pretty, pretty mm -hmm. good, but not, not good enough, you know, not big enough. Mm -hmm. So, but, so we've got the sport issues. What about the common issues within coaching, John? What would you say they are? And we touched upon some of them within <clears throat> that. Well, I think one of them until recently was, was coaching education. And you and I were talking before, you just got back from part three of your B license, I think. Yeah. You know, when I did my A license in 2004, the, the, the way that licensing worked was the instructor came there not to teach you, but their job was to weed out the people who weren't good enough. Yeah. So it wasn't really coaching education. It was it was coaching selection. Coaching survival. It's coaching survival. And so you yeah. would go there and you would get nothing out of it. And at that time, I so I really enjoyed the at the time the NSCAA courses because I felt like those are true education. And you got a diploma, not a license, but they were educational. I learned so much and I could knock on the door of Anson Dorrance or Chellis Hinman or these amazing instructors and say, hey, can you help me out here? Um, now, thankfully, US Soccer has done a, a fantastic revamp on their licensing. And now they weed you out before you get into the course. And then the job of the instructor is really, if we let Chris P in, my job is to make sure that you understand this and do the work so that you can pass the course. Yeah, And I think that change in attitude is going to pay dividends and we won't see it this year, right? But we'll see it 10 years, 20 years down the line with just far better educated coaches and plus a shift to a lot of the why behind things and, and cognition. The early licenses focused on 4v4 and 7v7 and the needs. Now, I still think that there is a ways to go in terms of um, understanding the person in front yeah, of you and what are the needs of the child. I thought that the U.S. Uh, national, the National Youth License yeah. uh, was the best course I ever took uh, years ago, 2009, 2010, something like that. Um, <clears throat> that was a fantastic course. And so I think we're losing a little bit, but still so much better. So th that's number one. But number two, helping coaches understand that when we think about what's the qualities of my favorite coach and we list things such as caring and communication and fairness and motivation and all these things that oftentimes we, we list, those are skills too. And therefore they can be learned and they can be developed. And so we have to work and help our coaches develop what we call the soft skills but really, those are the things that make coaches memorable. The, the X's and O's, the great sessions, that makes you a trainer. But all those other things make you a coach, make you a mentor, make you a role model. 
And so I think this is one of the things that we really have to do more of in coaching education, probably on a club level of how do we communicate? How do we communicate with um, parents, things like that? And so I would say number three then would be a lack of mentorship. In the sport of soccer, oftentimes we just look at, oh, you played great, here's your team, run with it. And so young coaches don't get a coaching mentor. And, um, you know, I, I just, I remember people in Rush, guys like Mark Zaffi in, in, um, Michi in Michigan and, you know, and Matt Dacey and, and, and Dave were in Virginia um, and, and Jay Hoffman was there. And, and they just said, you know, what we learned from Jay was so, so amazing, right? And here's a guy who won a World Cup. So, yeah. so you sit there. And, and you learn from someone like someone like that, not just on the field, but but off the field, over a coffee, over a beer. Um, so I I think you know, one of the things that my club here does now, which is great for me, and I hope great for some of the young coaches, is they do uh, because of my travel schedule. I can't. I still coach teams. I have two teams of 07 boys, but I'm gone quite a bit. And so what happens is. Each season or each year, the, the club assigns one, or actually this spring, I have two young coaches, just got out of college, played college soccer, want to get into coaching. And so they'll be my assistant coaches. And I'll, I'm at every training session, but we sit down, they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it. They're also copied on every time I send a note to a kid through Team Snap that says, <clears throat> Hey, I was a little bit hard on you today. Didn't come out right. And I didn't get to catch you after practice to tell you, here's what I meant. Or, hey, Chris, you've been working super hard. And today I think was one of your best practices ever. And uh, you left before I got to tell you that. Keep up the great work. Yeah. So I copy them on that. I copy them on keeping the parents in the loop and, and teach them how to communicate with your team, how to deal with an issue, um, <clears throat> how to take a phone call. And so at the end of a couple months, they've gotten everything that they're not going to learn in their nine aside grassroots license. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and I think that that's critical. And, and you don't you can't learn these things in a course. And so I think clubs <clears throat> need to do a better job of that. Yeah. Right. Assign us uh, your junior coaches to your senior coaches and, and, and help them learn everything that they really need to know that goes into managing a team and, and, and communicating with players outside of what you're going to learn on a piece of paper or watching, you know, getting a, a, a book of Pep Guardiola drills. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and a couple of things there. Obviously, you, you talked about the coaching ed and the coaching development. And as you know, we spoke offline. I, I'm just finishing. I've got the final week of my B. You know, Landon Donovan was a classmate who I know you'll be you know, get in with some time. But I think the Federation now has moved to three tenants and it was holistic, reality-based and experiential learning. Um, and, and they really tried hard to, to work on those aspects. And it was very different for me. You know, I'm glad I waited. I had a, an experience in 2003, maybe, with my C license out in Vegas. And it was just horrible. And it was, it was you know, coaching school survival. Uh, you know, I managed to pass but then decided to go to the UEFA route. And then after that, I did my national youth license, which I completely agree with you, was a fantastic license. Um, but I will say that this USSFB license has been challenging, um, but it has, it's also been, it's been what it said they were gonna do, right? With the exception of holistic, you know, picking a course right around Christmas where assignments are due, um, which isn't too holistic. But the, the thing is, 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 you know, they talk, they do talk about, you know, and you spoke about how can we teach, give the, these uh, young coaches the tools. So one of our assignments is, is managing the performance environment, right? Talking about our issues, talking about we'd overcome them and you have to turn in an assignment and you get green lighted or red lighted. But it's getting people now to think about it beyond the X's and O's, which I think is huge, right? Um, getting to know who's in front of you, which are the important things, um, you know, like your good friend, Chris van der Hagen says is, you know, know who's in front of you so you can reach them appropriately. And, and I mm -hmm. think that's huge. Um, you know, and I know you spoke, you spoke a little bit on, uh, for our mentees last week on the mentor program, 
And mm-hmm. it's, you know, I'll be in touch with you shortly about another program I'm starting. We're going to try and start the Spark Legacy program where we do bring people from the area together, different sports, different clubs, and just say, hey, okay, what are some of the issues? You know, how can we combat these issues? How can we work this to stop seven out of 10 teenagers dropping out of the sport? You know, mm-hmm. so we're trying to do things, but obviously we're looking at leaders in the field like yourself um, and how we can do that. <laughs> um, but now, you know, obviously you talk about these things within the new book, right? Um, which is why we have you on and we're excited to talk about. And, uh, you know, the new book is called Every Moment Matters, How the World's Best Coaches Inspire Their Athletes and Build a, uh, Championship Teams. T- tell us a bit about the book. There are 17 lessons in the book. I know that you've got lots of inspiration from the guests that you've had. Um, you know, t- tell us tell us about it. Tell us, you know, why everybody should be reading that book and, and how it can help us go to the next level and inspire and just be better for for everybody that we coach and everybody we come in contact with. Also, uh, recognizing um, my audience, uh, the number one email I get from coaches is when will the audio book be out? So (laughs) sometime in 2020, be patient. Um, Yeah, so I I wrote this book because one of the non-working subtitles could have been everything you should learn in coaching education and you don't. And like I said, thankfully, a lot of this is starting to change. But basically, the book was broken up into sort of four parts. Why do I coach? How do I coach? So how do people learn? And what is, how do I design practices and create a competitive environment? Um, what does it feel like to be coached by me? And then how do I define success? Because these are really the the questions that coaches should be asking themselves. And so I wanted to touch on on those areas and also cover a lot of these things that I, I think get skipped over. So for example, there's a chapter on the difference between coaching boys and girls. There's a chapter on coaching your own child. I think something like 80% of coaches coach their own kid. Well, that's different than coaching someone else's child because of all the implications that that can have to your relationship with with your son or your daughter. So I I thought these were the things, the questions I get a lot. How do I make my practices more competitive? How do I make them more representative? Um, How do we find a higher purpose than than did we just win? How do we how do we empower and engage our parents? That's a chapter as well. Right. How, 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 how as coaches, when we work with 18 sets of parents, are we not taught, here's how to work with parents, but we really aren't. So these are all different chapters in, in, in the book. And um, what you were just talking about from this perspective, from the U.S. soccer perspective of the, what were the words used, uh, holistic, realistic and. Yeah, holistic, reality based and experiential learning experiential learning right so teaching through the game play practice play um and also i have one chapter you know the title of it is you don't you know you can't come if you practice in the kind world you can't compete in the wicked world so we play and we coach this highly dynamic sport with constant decisions and assessments of our choices and adding deception and movement and no two passes are the same how representative is our practice of that environment. If, if we're sitting there having kids doing drills, doing passing patterns over and over and over for a half or three quarters of our practice with no defenders, no decisions, no direction, then it does not transfer to the game. Ugly learning. Touches. Yeah, 600 transfer. touches, not one decision. Yeah, you have you one decision. Spot on. and, and I used to be the guy who ran programs and said come to indoor training we'll get you a thousand touches and now i'm like no it's a if the goal is uh, 500 decisions not a thousand touches yeah yeah i I completely agree and you know we got into some good debates uh around you know with it with our class you know with our cohort and uh it was it was very interesting you know um you know but then there's there's one section on there as well that was a quote by chris vanderhagen um Great on paper, shit on grass. On grass. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and tell us a little about that, right? So we have the best laid plans, which I had on uh, on Thursday when I was presenting dead last in my group. Um, I planned for 14 players and I end up with eight. And instantly I, I 
you know, I'm adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. And I didn't paint the picture that I wanted. Uh, the players solved a different problem and created a new problem for me, um, which, you know, I was able to reflect on. But, you know, tell us, tell us a little bit about the practice design and, you know, what should coaches be considering, right, when they're going into their practice design? You know, I've always said as coaches, we want to project our vomit, what we know, onto players without really checking for understanding and seeing what they know, right? Yeah, exactly. And sometimes I think we just have to start at the end being what do we want it to look like on the weekend? And then we work back from there. And so what do, in a specific session, what do I want to accomplish this session? What are the activities that will uh, create that? Are these activities representative of the situations that people will find in the game? And then I think also, Am I also teaching and creating the space for the behaviors that promote long-term excellence? Yeah. Right? So, so integrity or creativity, self-organization, things like that, decision-making, I have to make sure where's the space and practice for these. So it can't just be, like you said, me spitting out as much information as possible in the next 75 minutes. It's what do I want to accomplish from this and then work back. And I think one of the biggest problems in, in coaching is not that you're not getting enough across, it's that you're trying to get too much too across. Too much across, yeah. Right? So less but better, right? Less, Te less, less things, but... teach them better and then interleave them. So it's not, we don't want to just hammer, hammer, hammer this thing and then move on. We want to teach it and then we want to teach something else. And then we come back to this and make our kids retrieve it and if they retrieve it and they can do it, that means they've learned it. And retrieval is a really important part of learning. So, you know, the book has, you know, every chapter sort of starts with a story and then comes in with sort of the research behind why this is important and then has activities that you can do to, to support that. And yeah. so to go back to your question, right, that was, you know, Chris Vanderhagen's thing is so many practices look great on paper, but they don't work. And yeah. this is a lot of coaches watch the clip on Sky Sports and say, oh, what was what was Klopp doing there? Here we go with the 10 year olds. And it doesn't work. Or again, I mentioned before, I think one of the biggest things is play, practice, play. If I'm coaching 12 and unders, they're always playing something first, whether it's a rondo or it's a small sided game. Show up. Here's your penny and play. They don't warm if they don't warm up for recess then they don't need to warm up for practice and they can play first. And especially our grassroots coaches. I know you manage so many of them in Virginia. And if you, if you think that you're going to get kids who just spent seven hours sitting in a seat in school, and then they're going to show up and stand in a line, you're nuts. Yeah. Right? And that as they show up late and run in at different times, you're going to explain to them that that this new drill five yeah. different times now you're not coaching you're just yeah. consistently explaining it to the new kid versus show up here's your penny as soon as two kids 1v1 2v2 4v4 and when kids see that there's a game going they run across the parking lot they run coach yeah. what team am i on and then they yell at their parents to get there early yeah you, and then you, you break it down yeah. and then you play again at the end yeah. and yeah. and that is so functional kids love it they come back next year. Um, I mean, Germany, Germany, the whole country of Germany for it was a 10 and under just went to Fanino, Horst Wien's Fanino, yeah. which is 3v3 to two, you know, attack two, defend two goals. The whole country, that's the mandatory youth development game okay. methodology now. At what age? <clears throat> I think it's 10 and under. 10 and under. So every 10 and under kid is playing 3v3, attack two, defend two. You can yeah. move the goals wide. You can move them in. You can put a ball on top of a cone, and a, a goal is when you can pass it and knock the ball off the knock cone. The off. You can change that. You play first. Then you break it down into some component, 2v1, 3v2, 1v0, whatever. Or you know, And, and it's just fun. Yeah. It's just great. Yeah, brilliant. And, you know, it's so true what you said. So when I came to Virginia, it's going to be six years ago now in May, um, we had 97 kids in our School of Excellence program, which was a paid program where parents didn't pay a little extra to not have parent coaches. 
we went from 97 children to 277 in the space of two and a half years. And all I did was say, okay, um, practice starts at 515, but if you're here at 430, the fields will be set up and your children get to play. So mm -hmm. we, we would implement play and children would just play and little six, seven, eight year old kids were telling, dragging their parents and saying, hey, I wanna go to training, as opposed to, are we done yet? And when do we get a game, right? Which are the common questions that people get. I was at I was at a couple of years ago. I was at the Cliff Manchester United, yeah. which now is not Carrington's, where the seniors yeah. and the older kids train. But that used to be the place. Now it's their nines, tens, and elevens use yeah. the Cliff. I was there, and the there was eight year olds were playing, and I'm sitting there in, on the field. Yeah. And there's 30 minutes between when the eight year olds are done and the nine and tens start. And every one of them is there because they knew for that 30 minutes, they just got to play. And it, it was like being on a New York subway where you pull up to the station and everyone's pressed up against the train, ready to pour in the train. That was the kids when the moment when they were done and everyone else cleared out and the coach was like, come on, it was like, boom, and games yeah. just started. And then those games bled into the beginning of practice. Yeah. Then the coaches ran a great practice, very little coaching or no coaching when the ball was rolling, yeah. coaching when the ball stopped, and, and then they played again at the end. Yeah. It was brilliant. Yeah. I'm a kid. That's why they signed up. They signed up to play. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're spot on. And uh, I'm sure you were visiting Tom Statham, and Tom's always been accommodating. I had the same experience there maybe five or six years ago. And uh, I took two boys over, and the coach comes over, and he hands me a session plan. And the first priority of the session plan, the first objective, was fun. And that changed things for me, right? Man United, one of the biggest clubs in the world, and their first objective was fun. And I'm thinking, man, who am I to take myself so seriously, <laughs> you know, when Man United's first objective is fun, you yeah. know? Um, yeah, now in the book, John, you talk about interleaving and you gave a great example. I think it was uh, Cal State or something and about the baseballers and, and just receiving 45 pitches. And the one was... Uh, and we don't want to go too much into the book, but it was 45. It was 15 fastballs, 15 curveballs, 15 uh, sliders, whatever. And then there was a, a group of batters that took uh, 45 balls, but all random. And, uh, you know, in the early practice, it, you know, it showed that the, the guys that were hitting the, the predetermined balls showed uh, improvement in the first couple of weeks. But over the six weeks, it was the ones that had the random balls pitched at them that showed, you know, they had to pay more attention, focus, look at the external factors to, to realize that, you know, the, the, the learning was messier, but it stuck for longer, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> the, the thing is, during those six weeks, the people who knew what was coming, they're driving the ball all over the field. They're, quote, playing better. Yeah. Right. And the ones who don't know what's coming, they're fouling balls off, they're hitting grounders. But what they're learning to do is read pitches. Yeah. and anticipate pitches and, and think about what's coming and that's hitting. And, yeah. and so all of a sudden at the end of six weeks, one group is thinking that they're becoming a better hitter and one group's thinking that I'm not, but actually the ones who thought they got better didn't get nearly as much better as the ones who thought they weren't getting better. And so this is our challenge as coaches as well. When we interleave our practices, it's quite the challenge to convince our players and their parents that learning is taking place. Because if we just do the same thing over and over and over all day with no pressure, um, at the end of that day, it'll feel like you're better, right? And yeah. I always think golf is the perfect example of this. There's lots of us play golf and we're all really good on the range. And then all of a sudden you go to the course and you can't hit that ball. And there was a great study, uh, I think Ian Renshaw did it, where he, he put the full-on sort of virtual suit on professional golfers that they make animated movies from. And they, the golfers hit 10 seven irons on the range. And they hit, they made the same exact swing 10 times in a row, right? Mapped it out perfectly. Then he put them on the course in 10 situations where they had to hit a seven iron, one where they had to draw it, one where they had to fade it, one where the ball was above their feet, one the ball's below their feet, 
um, one in the rough, one in the fairway, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they do all these different things and they made 10 completely different swings based on the environment. So this is it. We never play the same pass. We never hit the same shot. Um, and, and if we are, uh, again, creating this super kind environment in practice, it's not going to transfer. Now, this isn't to say that there's never a time to pull a kid out and say, here's how to hit a ball with your laces, right? Yeah. Let's hit three or four and let's get you back in there. But no one can tell me that it's, if you are teaching passing and not just how to lock your ankle, but actual passing, that playing a 4v1 rondo is not better than pass and follow your pass yeah, the other line, which never yeah. happens. Absolutely. I, I yeah. completely agree. And these are the arguments we get in. But, you know, that's I think it, it goes back into problem number two, coaching issue, right? Um, which was, you know, how we communicate with the stakeholders, because parents want to instant gratification, just like the players. How can we as coaches influence parents and say, listen, here's the science and research behind it. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Right. But how many of us actually take the time? You know, when you when you talk to most coaches, you know, a lot of coaches will say, well, I wish I coached a group of orphans, but they have to see that the parents are indeed the team behind the team and could be your biggest allies, but only if we just communicate clearly with them. You know? Exactly. And, and, just... and again, as a coach, you'll never, and this is again, a whole, a whole chapter, um, which I think I, I quote sky is the chapter title, which is most, some parents are crazy, but most are just stressed. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, how many times have you coached a practice and everything goes great and you think it's fine and my kids all have to shake the coach's hands before they leave and all that sort of stuff and you say bye to a kid and then he gets in his car or she gets in the car and bursts into tears <clears throat> because someone was mean to me or I didn't think I played well. Now, as a coach, I would never know that. There's no possible way for me to know that. If that happens three days in a row, if that parent doesn't have the trust in me to tell me that well i'll never know now the coach is getting now the parents getting angry thinking wow this is a bad situation why isn't the coach fixing this why is my kid upset and realistically it's the kid doesn't even yeah. you know i don't even know <laughs> i don't even know what's happening but if that parent calls me i can talk to the kid i can fix the situation and and move on and so i think yeah. this one of the critical things of parents that in yes some of them we will never get it yeah. but then our job i think as a coach is to help create an environment on our sideline where the ones who will never get it it's really uncomfortable to be there and then they either change their behavior or they leave but either way they're out of your hair yeah no i think i think that's very important one's just typed in uh, actually, about 15 minutes ago, he said there are a number of independent schools in the UK introducing sport or free play from 8 to 4, 8 to 8.45 every morning, and their results have skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? so exactly. Yeah. My, my kids' elementary school used to do this thing every year. They called it the marathon, and, and they had a um, they had a, it was a half mile loop out of the back of the elementary school. And so they would challenge all the kids to over the course of two weeks before school, during every recess and, and lunch to try to run a marathon. So to try to run 26 miles in, in two weeks or, or walk it, right? And every kid was engaged. You'd show up there, the kids would be running before school. You know, they're, they're running laps, they're doing all this stuff. <clears throat> and I would ask the teachers, how's behavior these weeks? Oh, it's great, it's best weeks. Yeah. <clears throat> how's testing ah oh, it's great it's awesome right because we have all this evidence i said so what are you going to do about this nothing we just do this for two weeks and one yeah. of the teachers had been there forever he said you know we used to do dancing before school and same thing behavior issues down academic performance up and and, and so juan's exactly right and so this is our biggest problem is the system doesn't necessarily look at the evidence because the system has created policies and procedures around a way of doing things. And it doesn't create the space for all this evidence that says, if we just had them play games and run laps before school, they would perform better and we'd have less discipline uh, issues. We'd have better behavior. We'd have a better teaching environment, 
all the evidence says that, but doesn't fit into the system. Yeah, no, it's it's funny, you know, and uh, you know, listening to Paul talk about it, and uh, then you know, when you look at it from a parent perspective, parents want to know, well, is it organized? Who's going to be supervising? Who's gonna? What are they going to really learn if they're just playing? They don't mm -hmm. they don't realize the importance of play, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, 10 years ago, I ran two programs and it was a skills program. It was basically the FA Coca-Cola skills program and a free play program. And we found that we had 70 kids in the Coca-Cola skills program because there was a certificate at the end of it, but not as many in the free play. And then towards the end, it started to flip. Well, no, I don't want to be in this isolated environment. I want it to be in this chaotic, random environment with small sided games where I can make the rules and... You know, slowly, slowly, we're getting there, you know, but uh, it's the same old challenges over and over, right? Mm -hmm. um, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, now, I, I can't see any questions, Chris, if they come up. I think you're the only one who yeah, sees them, but I hope yeah. we've got people on. Please ask questions, not just yeah. Juan. We love Juan, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please add questions, add questions. Um, in the book, though, John, you talked about your session design, right? Um, the Federation has certain things that they want done now, and it's like, is it organized? Is it game-like? Is there repetition without repetition? Is it challenging? And is there effective coaching? Um, so these are the things. And then in the book, you, you asked five questions, if I'm not mistaken, right? And you spoke about some of them. And it was, how do we want to play? So starting with the end in mind. Learning objectives for the session based on number one. Activities needed to get one and two. Um, organized so children love it. Is it organized? And how can we uh, tie in the values to have a higher purpose than just winning, which you mm -hmm. spoke about, which I think dovetails um, with what the Federation's looking yeah. at with no, from exactly grassroots it. to uh, yeah. on about it. But it, it also goes into the five W's, which were um, evident in, 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 the, in the B license course, in the A license course, in the C. And, you know, what is happening? Where is it happening? Who's involved? When is it happening and why is it happening, right? So just looking at those things and thinking about, just really thinking about the people first, people-centered, and then the players. Okay, mm -hmm. is this in the player's toolkit? Do I need to go back to my toolkit as a coach? What can I get out of this player? And so on and so forth, right? So and is it challenging? Like, I think that's such an important yeah. thing. I think two things that I look for if I ran a great practice are, one, a little bit of frustration because yeah. couldn't quite get that, right? So it wasn't perfect. And that's for the players, not for you, right? <laughs> well, sometimes both. Yeah, sometimes right? both. Yeah. Um, and number two, I love when practice ends and a kid, you call everyone in, you say, grab the cones, and the kid goes, wait, it's done? It's done already? Yeah. It's done Absolutely. already? To me, yeah. that says you, you nailed it because they were in flow, right? They're just the time flew by and all of a sudden, 75 minutes, 90 minutes, it's gone. And you're like, wait, what, we're done? And yeah. I think this is such an amazing thing, right? Is is this ability to, um, to just blast through practice so well that kids are just so engaged in the process that all of a sudden that hour and a half flew by and they didn't even realize it. I always think that's like, okay, that, that went well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's huge. You know, I think it's huge. Um, now, in the in the book, you also talk about the rule of one, which is something you and Jerry um, designed. I know Mark Mark Bennett has his rule of three. Um, share your rule of one because I think it's absolutely brilliant. Sure, and this is it was Jerry's terminology um, <clears throat> that I had sort of I had not described as succinctly, so I stole his verbiage, which yeah. is one person, one comment, one time can change your life. And we're coaches, we work with kids, it's public, it's emotional, and we never know if today's the day that th what we say is going to stick, either positive or negative. We never know if today is the day when they're actually so tuned in and they're ready to learn. And, and so we have to be on our game. We have to be really intentional about getting around to all the kids, making that little comment, not always a critique, but sometimes catching them being good. Uh, because that one comment, one time, that could that could fuel the kid for the next two weeks, it could fuel them for the next month, especially when we work like I do with middle schoolers where, you know, each day can be the greatest day or the worst day ever. And yeah. so <clears throat> you're, you're always looking for these moments of, 
can I, can I, can I fill that kid's tank? And um, that's what the rule of one is. And if you coach, and especially if you have an assistant coach, if you sort of say, hey, I want you to, you know, let, let's, let's make sure we get around every kid today. Let's catch every kid doing something right. Because it's very easy to catch a kid do something wrong six different times. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and so if we can be intentional about catching them doing right, really good things happen, I think. I think I think you're spot on. I, the only thing I would add to that, John, is is it's not maybe fuel them for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. I think it, our words go deeper, and it can last a lifetime, as you know, right? The influence goes on and multiplies, and I, I, you know it can take months to build a kid's confidence, but we can shatter it with a few misplaced words. And, yeah. You know, we spoke about this a little bit at our B license. Uh, I did a little closing, um, and and actually. Steve Davis from New York, who you know very well too, he, you know, he once asked, you know, if you were given $86,400 every day, how would you spend it? You know, um, and that's what I asked that my classmates, you know, our words matter, every moment matters. Um, but, you know, the 86,400 is the seconds we get every day. So we have to, you know, be wise and, and smart with them um, and how we use that. Now, in the book, John, as well, you, always, you also talk about uh, culture, if I'm not wrong, right? Do you want to, you know, what advice, tips would you give to the people that are on this who will watch this later as well on to get the best culture that you can, you know, to manage the performance environment and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have to understand that behaviors is when when we're working with young kids what we're really doing is shaping behavior right the technical and tactical stuff is nice and fine and dandy but if we don't shape behaviors in the right way and, and create the type of behaviors the creativity the resilience the ability to organize things the ability to make decisions um teachable spirit all these sort of things where we're shaping behavior and culture shapes behavior Right. Your mm -hmm. environment shapes what you're uh, allowed to do. If you work in an office where, you know, everyone brings a flask of whiskey and gets drunk every day, um, you're you're going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll bring my whiskey today, too. But if no one does that, you're not going to bring a flask of whiskey to work every day. Right. And, and so environment shapes behaviors. And oftentimes as coaches, we, we leave culture to chance. We leave environment to chance. We sit there and we're like, I, I hope we have a hardworking team. I hope we compete hard. But why aren't we intentional about creating this type of environment in training where day after day, these are the things that are non-negotiables? So you know, in June, when I took over this group of 07 boys here, the first thing I said to the kids and the parents is the first couple months, we're pretty much going to learn how to practice because we don't practice well, right? People aren't focused. People don't listen to the coaches. People kind of show up and their ball's not pumped up. They don't have their shin guards on. Their shoes aren't tied. And so we're going to learn to practice. And once we get good at practice, we're going to get pretty good in the games. And how did we get, how do we get better at practice? Well, we need certain behaviors that are non-negotiables. And, and for me, personally as a coach that's that this is really fun that we enjoy the heck out of this that we we compete really really hard every moment and that's usually not such a problem with 12 year old boys yeah. and that and that we're accountable so that I, I i listen to the coaches i understand what's happening i hold my teammates accountable so that if chris is not in the right spot I fix it for him. This is a Mark Bennett thing, right? Yeah. That if if you are not doing your thing, my job is to fix it for him. And it was amazing, you know, in the beginning, how I would, I, you know, something would be going wrong and I'd let it play out for a bit. And then I would say, stop, um, what's going on here? And I'd turn to a kid and say, well, what's the problem? And they say, well, you know, Chris P is not forcing the guy wide when he presses him. I said, great. How long have you noticed that? for two minutes we've been playing he hasn't done it why didn't you say anything say to chris okay. p yeah. uh I, I, like your job is to tell him now 12 year old boys you have to be very careful because they can be very cruel yeah. <laughs> right so so you now i have to teach well how can you say that maybe in a better way that doesn't make chris yeah. 
hate you and 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 hate coming here. Um, but these are the things that I think culture shapes these behaviors. And you know, for for my group this fall, we got pretty good by the end of the year, um, the end of the fall season, because we got very good at practice. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I love that. Um, if there's any questions from the group, please type them in. Oh, they're starting to come in, John. Bear with me. Um, uh, and it's from Juan again, <laughs> but that's okay. He's got the ball rolling. Children players will buy into culture. Most parents and adults will as well. However, there is always one child influenced by the adults and parents that may not. E.g., I had a 15-year-old that wouldn't buy into anything we did because they weren't repeating stuff and we we weren't learning how to pass or tackle or whatever. They ended up affecting the entire team. What do we do? Mm. One asks. Awesome. I had a kid like that um, recently um, who, whose parent wouldn't buy in. And there's the greatest uh, complaint letter ever that I've ever gotten as a coach, which went not to me, to the club technical director. And, and I quote the letter and saying, all they do at practice is learn how to play the game. Guilty as charged. Yeah, I would right? take that. Yeah. We're playing, right? And if you have something that's not working for you, then go home and please work on it on your own, right? And I've shown kids how to do it. And there's tons of YouTube links that I've shown you how to do this or do that. But you need to go work on this on your own. So yeah. when we come together as a group, that that's our time. To do this so i think in one situation that's exactly it they're looking at this and saying we can't pass so therefore that's all we should be working on in, in practice and they want that isolated repetitive passing but what juan knows is yeah but that's not going to that that has nothing to do with passing when a defender's closing you down and two others and who do you pass to and when do i pass it and how do i lead that player um, only the game, only constrained games teach us um, actually how to pass in a game-like situation. Only those ones transfer. And so <clears throat> my thing is, if you are familiar with the evidence, right? I know what's right. I've read the research. I know what works. I know what transfers. I've been able to speak to the best people in the world. I've shared it in this book. So if anyone reads the book, you know this as well. So when that parent who hasn't done any of those things gets upset, you just say, hey, here's why. You know, here's the research. Here's why this is done this way. Here's what England Rugby says. Here's what the FA says we're supposed to do. If you have a problem, your problem is not with me. Your problem is with them who've spent years coming up with this curriculum or whatever. Um, and so I didn't change because that parent was upset. I said, this is how we do things here. Maybe there's yeah. a better fit somewhere else. And and she left and went to a different club. Yeah. And probably facing similar issues. Right. But or, or the kids doing block practice and then quits because everything's boring. Right. Yep. So John, I want to be sensitive of your time. Um, tell us, John, where can we, where can people find the book? Where can people follow your work? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so obviously uh, the book is on Amazon right now is, is the best place to get it and the quickest to get it shipped to you and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, and then I also am offering, uh, after I did the development, uh, the mentor webinar last week, uh, a couple of those clubs reached out and grabbed 10 books or 20 books for their staff. So if that's something you want to do, I'd do 25% off per book and get them to you as well. And to do that, just email me directly, john, J-O-H-N, at changingthegameproject.com. And then changingthegameproject.com is the mothership. So that's where you can find our blog. That's where you can find uh, Way of Champions podcast. Um uh, as well, if you want to connect with that, I think a lot of you already have, but the, that's that's sort of the the best place. But again, that email goes straight to me, and um, anything I can do to help is is you know, the, this is what I want. I love Rush Soccer. I love yeah. what uh, it stands for, and I've been a Rush guy since 2006 now. So yeah. um, it's a 13 years. Holy cow! So yeah, yeah, 14, 14 soon. 14 soon yeah so yeah for john thanks for joining us obviously um just uh, tell my friend landon when you talk to him that all men are cremated equal 
Um, so just uh, send regards and then everybody will share this and please pass it on. Get on the Way of Champions podcast because John is doing a brilliant job. Let's help him get to a million um, downloads. He's at 700,000 right now. Let's get to a million and let's do it quickly. And uh, just keep sharing the stuff. Keep following John's work. And uh, John is great at getting back to emails and stuff like that. Um, have happy holidays, everybody. John, safe travels to Italy. Thank you for being an influence and uh, in my life and being able to get me through my workouts. And thanks for all you do. And I look forward to connecting soon. And uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, and everyone. Happy Christmas and see you soon. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Johnny. Bye. Bye. Now I've got to figure out how to end this. All right, buddy. I got to run, okay? All right. See you. Thanks a lot, John. Bye. Friend.